How do you do both? How do you wage a war and conduct a hostage rescue mission at the same time? It's very difficult, obviously. Um, and I don't think that the Israelis have any illusions about uh, the difficulty of what's ahead of them. Um, as you heard the uh, deputy ambassador there speaking about, um, they will try to do both at the same time, um, and that will require some precision. And he didn't really um, dismiss the idea of collateral damage, mm -hmm. um, potentially. And I think that that is something that, um, in his very unequivocal remarks, we, we you know, we take those uh, at face value, and, and obviously they, they realize what they're up against. Yeah, sobering. So, yeah, very sobering, yes. Um, we do know, <clears throat> due to the president's comments today, to Jake Sullivan's comments today, that Americans are likely, well, the president said no, they are held hostage. I wonder what kind of pressure Israel will be under from not just America, but other nationals that were taken hostage by Hamas to make sure that, to Dan's point, that precision better be correct. I'm sure they will be under pressure, but if there's one thing we know about Israel watching them over the years, they are not very, they are very immune, I should say, to pressure from the international community. They do what they believe is right for the security of their nation, and they will do it. And I think Eliyav Benjamin there was, as Dan said, extremely unequivocal. They're going to crush Hamas. If they can rescue some hostages at the same time, great. But the primary objective, in his words, were to crush Hamas. Getting back to our conversation with John Kirby, we just learned a lot in the last 15 yeah. minutes here. Uh, the Gerald Ford uh, strike group mm -hmm. is going to be a key component, I assume, in, in the operational side of this. I realize that the carrier strike group may not be sending fighter jets into Israel or troops into Israel anytime soon, but this is an incredibly capable high-tech uh, operation here that could do a lot to help Israel in coordination and in intelligence. How do you see that? Yeah, I think that's right, Joe. I mean, if you look at what Admiral Kirby said, he said the U.S. is going to be deepening its intelligence relationship with Israel. Yeah. So what does that mean? How did this happen? Uh, my colleague Pete Martin had a great story out today about some of the intelligence failures that led up to this. And one of the things that he identified in his story was the fact that Hamas essentially went dark. Mm -hmm. And that means no electronic communications. That phase of whatever this was is over now. And I think we can assume that there are going to be some communications happening now, especially as Hamas tries to uh, assume a defensive posture based on whatever the Israelis are going to do. Well, and the strike group will p play a role in that, I'm sure. We're also getting two different tones from Israel and the United States when it comes to Iran. Ron Dermer told our colleagues that it is their working condition at this moment that there is evidence that more directly links Iran to this specific attack, while the United States continues to say they do not see that evidence. And that's not that John Kirby just said it's not their working condition. Right. How difficult is that going to be? Because if Iran is more complicit in this and directly linked, this has real risks of broadening out in the region. Absolutely. And you heard Admiral Kirby say the strike group is there to serve as a deterrent. And I think they're you know, trying to tread a very uh, thin line here between directly connecting Iran to these attacks and just saying that they've provided support over the years, which we know. So he said there's no evidence that, they've, that we've seen so far, but he didn't say that there's not evidence. So it's, it's potential, you know, that You're this right. could come to light in the coming days. And that's part of the sensitivity of this issue is once you bring that evidence forward, you're sort of compelled to act. And I think that that's what they want to avoid at this point before all the cards are on the table, basically. Wow. I think there's also politics involved very quickly. I mean, it's not in the U.S. interest to poke the bear of Iran right now for the U.S. And Israel's been, frankly, itching to get into it with Iran for years. Mm -hmm. So, sure, to Ron Dermer's ears, it was Iran. To, uh, to Biden's ears, it's, let's be a little more careful. This, of course, is all happening against the backdrop of a speaker's fight uh, here in Washington that also plays into Israel by way of funding, which uh, remains a question. And this is a story that really has not progressed. We had a visit today here at Bloomberg in Washington by Larry Hogan, the former governor of Maryland, a Republican, of course. He spoke to the chaos in the House Republican caucus and how it's echoing throughout the party. Here's what he said. It's a train wreck. I mean, it's uh, it's embarrassing. And uh, I think it's terrible for the Republican Party. I think it's terrible for, for the Congress and for the country. 
Um, the fact that you can have a handful of uh, extremist kind of quacks uh, off the rails that can put us in this kind of jeopardy. And it was a terrible mistake. He wasn't mincing words, of course. He's also said to be on the short list if there were, and he did speak to this, the opportunity for maybe uh, a, 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 either a Republican candidacy or a no labels candidacy on, on his behalf. But he's speaking to the ripple effects outside of the Beltway. How much time do Republicans have in Washington to figure this out? Well, not much. The government's going to shut down again yeah. on November 17th if they can't get the spending fight done. But they can't get the spending fight done, the budget passed, until they have a speaker, nor can they speed aid to Israel or Ukraine mm -hmm. until they have a leader. They're talking about giving the temporary acting speaker, Patrick McHenry, some new powers yeah. so they can do that. Democrats are thinking about going along with that. Um, but, you know, the I, to, tomorrow we are supposed to start voting. The House Republicans, I should say, are supposed to start voting on a speaker. One of those guys, Steve Scalise or Jim Jordan, has to have 218 votes or 217 votes. I don't see that happening in the next 48 hours, but, you know, maybe this will spur some action. Dan, you're up on the Hill all the time. You also were in the Army, so you actually understand kind of how aid gets done and then what it's used for. How likely is the pressure building on this Republican Party to quickly get a speaker so they can, in fact, supply aid to Israel and also Ukraine? Because the president say, said for the national security concerns of our, quote, partners. Yeah, it's a great question. I do have to clarify, I was in the Marine Corps. And as any good that Marine confused. will tell you, wow. My deepest don't get those apologies. confused. I but it's OK. That. Um, <laughs> I thought that after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that a lot of this political infighting would sort of go away based on what's the very serious matters that are unfolding on the world stage. And yet here we are. Of course, the speaker fight began before the events of this weekend unfolded, but still, I don't necessarily think that because there's a crisis on the world stage, it's going to impel our congressional representatives to move more quickly to resolve their internal squabbles. Mm -hmm. That is something that, as we've seen, is going to be a perennial issue in D.C., no matter what's happening uh, abroad.